Okay, welcome back. So hopefully by now you've had a chance to run uh, the generator and you've generated around 10,000 uh, Z prime to EE events. Um, so uh, not only have you done that, but you've also converted those events into a format which is now Atlas readable. So for the next steps, we'll then go on to actually read in some of those events and do analysis with them. So this section is the so-called Truth Monte Carlo MC analysis section. <clears throat> so as mentioned, so this is, as we talked about in the, in the last talk, this is the process that you are generating with the, with the generator. And essentially what you told the generator to do was generate 10,000 proton-proton collisions, all of which result in a Z prime and then subsequently decay to two electrons. So you now have a sample containing 10,000 of these events. Now, of course, in nature we can't control that uh, every time we do a collision at the LHC that it provides us with exactly this. It's probabilistic of what will be created. In fact, if this isn't represented in nature, then this wouldn't happen at all. Um, but what we do with the generators is that we tell the LHC exactly to generate these events, and then later we scale them according to their different probabilities. And in fact, because the theory is not 100% known, uh, these uh, values can actually be scaled up or down depending on how strong or weak you want the signal to be. Um, but it's still useful to have you know, 10,000, 100,000 events to do studies to actually analyze what we can uh, try to select with the Atlas detector to try and observe these kind of events. So we have this process that we've generated now. So going back to the diagram earlier of how this looks in the detector, we now have to figure out how we can actually identify these events and then figure out how to reconstruct, because remember the detector is only going to see these events at the end. It's only going to see these objects, sorry, at the end, just the electron and the positron. It won't be able to directly see the Z-prime. We have to infer the Z-prime's interference by reconstructing these particles and then adding back together what happened uh, at, in the original collision. So the way we're going to do this, the, the uh, file format that you converted this generation into essentially lists all of the particles in the event. It's actually getting to what we call the quote-unquote truth information, which of course we can't look at in real data, we can't peek under the hood in real data, but because we've generated these events, we can say, okay, uh, you put uh, two electrons in each of these 10,000 events, and you can label them so that I can say, give me two electrons. In this truth information, I can even see the Z prime, even though in nature you wouldn't be able to directly observe it, and say, okay, give me that particle and tell me some information about it. And that's what, at this level, we're going to write some analysis code to do. And then later in the tutorial, we'll actually go on to look at real data, of which you can only look at this information after it's been fully reconstructed by the detector. So what kind of information can we ask of these objects? So the code that we're writing in is C++, which is an object-oriented computing language. And the advantage of that is that each of these uh, uh, particles can be treated as objects within the code that have a certain number of properties. So for example, if we select an electron in the code, that has a number of properties like the direction that it's flying in, how much energy it has, what its mass is. You can ask this object of an electron for those properties and it will return them to you that you can then use in the code. So just to go through a few of the useful kinematic properties, so again we have a, a diagram of the Atlas detector here as a barrel uh, with the beam line coming through the center. So you know often you would just think of the normal coordinate system of an XYZ coordinate system. Technically the beam line direction is defined as the Z direction um, in Atlas, and then you have X and Y going out perpendicular uh, from that. But actually we don't really use the XYZ coordinate system very much within Atlas. We use a different one which is much more useful uh, when we come to these kind of experiments, uh, where for example one is the eta distribution. Um, so eta is defined if you take the beam line, um, and if you go straight up from the beam line as it were, that would give you an eta of zero. And then it's a logarithmic function. As you get closer and closer to the beam line, this value of eta goes towards infinity. So it's actually a logarithmic function, okay, that's dependent on the angle theta. But we just talk about eta here as going from zero, as in directly up, towards infinity as you get towards the beam line. And really, 
it's a nearly four pi detector, we almost have complete coverage, but not exactly along the beam line, so we wouldn't be able to see particles that go directly down the beam line around eta of infinity. We usually make a cut in the analysis that we only look at eta values within the range of, say, four to five at maximum. Okay, and an eta range of four to five still gets you, you know, pretty close to the beam line going out. Um, and then, you know, around zero, you have a big part of the detector that we observe events in here. So that's the eta distribution, which you'll be seeing more of in your coding. And then another useful parameter here is the phi distribution. So if you think of any direction you could point around the beam pipe, pointing outwards into the detector, Think of any radius here pointing outwards, for example, looking at the end, that would give you a phi direction. So pointing again directly up gives you a phi of zero, and then you can count round in a clockwise fashion um, for two pi to get you back to the original direction. Okay, so a phi of pi would be pointing downwards, for example. So you can see that between using eta and phi, you can then define any vector direction inside the detector uh, originating from the collision point in the center. Okay, so these are the main two uh, directional variables that we use, eta and phi of any of these objects. Um, but then there are many other properties. One which will become very useful as well is the transverse momentum or transverse energy. Um, so this is the energy of the particle or the momentum of the particle perpendicular to the beam line as well. So you can tell its direction and you can tell how much energy it has and with that you essentially can almost fully reconstruct some of the main properties of the particle, at least at truth level. So we'll be dealing with these uh, properties uh, in the code that you're about to look at. Um, of course the masses of the electrons themselves are very small but if you take the vectors that represent the electron and the positron in the event and you add them back together, you can work out what mass from its energy and direction of these two, you can work out what mass the Z prime would have had. Um, and then this can give you, if you've generated the Z prime like we did at a mass of 3 TeV, then you should find when you add these two particles back together that you get a Z prime that has around a mass of 3 TeV. Okay? Um, so, you're going to go through some analysis code which essentially looks inside the sample of 10,000 events you've selected, uh, looks at the two electrons and tries to select them, work out which one has the highest energy because they don't always have a completely balanced PT, so which one is the highest energy out of the two and plot one in one histogram, one in the other. Uh, it will also allow you to take a peek at the Z prime and plot what its mass is. And I mentioned the word plot there, so you know, I've been talking about a computer algorithm to be able to select these uh, objects and uh, pull out some of the kinematic information, but how do we display that information? So this comes on to the use of histograms, which we use extensively within Atlas, uh, so you'll become very familiar with those over time. Um, so a histogram, remember, has a certain number of bins. And essentially, if you think of it, for every collision at the LHC, if we take the mass of the Z prime, for example, for every uh, collision, for every event, we can put one entry okay, uh, into this histogram, if this is the mass histogram. So if it had low energy or low mass, it would be somewhere down here. If it had very high energy, then it would be up here. And generally, when we do collisions at the LHC, the higher the energy, the fewer times you see it because you need the protons to hit directly head on. Many of the times they you know, are glancing off each other so you get a little bit less energy. Or you've created a particle at a low energy with a high momentum, um, so that can happen often as well. Um, but essentially, every time we have a collision, we put an event into this bin and then you can build up a distribution of the masses that you observe. So this histogram would have around 10,000 entries for the process that you just generated. And all of these different uh, kinematic variables we've been talking about can be plotted in these distributions. Okay? So if we take the eta distribution to begin with, then uh, remember eta we said goes from zero to uh, infinity. And in fact, I went in one direction for infinity. If you go in the other direction, then you can get a minus eta value. So it goes to minus infinity. Um, and so in a plot of the eta distribution, you would have zero in the center, 
and because we generally look up, look up to eta values of 3, 4, 5, the maximum on the x-axis is 3 and the minimum is minus 3. And so for every event, I could take the z-prime, or the leptons, and I could fill their eta value, this direction that each of the electrons or the z-prime has, and I would build up a certain distribution that you can look at. One of the most sensitive variables when we're searching for new physics is the mass distribution. So adding back together the energy of these two electrons together with their direction and figuring out what was the mass of the particle they came from. So the standard model gives us a prediction of what we would see. So that you have this, this peak, this resonance around the Z mass, which is around 90 GeV. And then you have a falling distribution as you get to higher and higher masses. Okay? This is what the standard model predicts. And there are other processes that can mimic these two electrons, just as TT bar and di bosons, and even high energy jets that fake electrons. But we'll come on to more detail in that later. Uh, the important thing here is that we have the prediction from the standard model, which would be a peak with a smooth, smoothly falling distribution in this di-electron mass distribution. Um, but if the Z prime was present, and particularly in this case, if it was present at 3 TeV, then you would see a bump in this distribution, another resonance where this Z prime particle existed. You know, if the mass of the Z prime was 2 TeV, then you'd see the peak around 2 TeV on the axis here, or 2000 GeV. If it was 5 TeV, you would see the peak out later. And so our job as experimentalists, why are we looking at these signals and comparing it to the, the, the simulation of what we understand from the standard model, is these are all of our simulations, and then we collect real data. And if you can imagine these blue points are data, you can imagine that we plot those together with our histogram, and we see if our predictions agree or disagree with what the data gives. So right here you can see that the data is agreeing pretty well with uh, our prediction. And imagine if uh, the data continued on and followed this black curve, then at some point we'd have enough statistical precision to say that we have excluded, we know that a Z prime does not exist at a mass of 3 dV, otherwise the data should have followed this curve rather than the background only distribution. Um, if, for example, uh, then I draw another Z prime at around 4 TeV, so another peak like this. And imagine that we collect, continued to collect more and more data, and that eventually we got enough data and you see that the data starts to follow this curve, then we would eventually say, ah, now we have discovered a Z prime because it no longer follows just the standard model prediction, but it follows the standard model plus our new Z prime signal at a mass of 4 TeV, so we would claim a discovery. And in fact, in 2012, this is very similar to how the Higgs boson was discovered. Uh, first, I think, in the diphoton distribution, so adding the energy of two photons back together, you saw a very small bump that was statistically significant above five standard deviations, we say in particle physics, is proof of uh, a discovery of a new particle that uh, follows the distribution. So that's why we're doing these comparisons and plotting these different variables because we want to compare our simulations both of the expected standard model and the possible new physics beyond the standard model to the data we actually collect at the LHC. And you'll also come later in this tutorial uh, to actually running over real data and comparing it to the full stimulation of the standard model uh, to do a little check yourself and some of the statistical analysis associated with this. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. What you're going to do in the next step of this analysis now, this truth Monte Carlo analysis, is you're going to take the file that you created, you're going to uh, run some analysis code over it to pick out some of these variables. I've put some in there for you, but then I ask you to actually add uh, some more variables and some cuts yourself. Then you'll plot those into different histograms, and then what you're gonna do in yet another script is uh, make some uh, nice images that can be put into presentations and are eventually what we publish in our papers as well, ways to uh, present this information in a clear way. Of course, at the moment, you've only generated Z prime events, so you're not gonna see this black curve or all these blue dots for the data. You're just gonna see a red bump, hopefully, in the mass distribution, and then some other distributions for the other kinematic variables. But this is a useful exercise for you to see how we approach analyzing the data at the LHC and what are some of the common plots that we look at. So after you've done that, 
we'll come back here and we'll start to talk about the next stage of the analysis. So thank you very much.